Hello everybody, hello YouTube, hello art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M, and I'm back with another video. This time, I think, or I hope, the video is going to more closely resemble an actual art history lecture. But I can only hope. I, I, I haven't done it yet, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but what is the topic of today's video? Today I want to talk about iconography. Iconography and art and why it's such a confusing subject for a lot of people, oddly enough. A lot of people who are well versed in things like art history and people who are not so well versed. And I hope I don't make things more confusing. That's the only thing that I can really say that I, I want to achieve with this. I'm trying to make it less confusing, not more. But <clears throat> as you can see before you on the screen, there is an image of a very famous film director. Uh, and many of you probably already know his name and probably have watched a lot of movies that he has he directed uh, during his lifetime. Uh, his name was Alfred Hitchcock, and he brought us, again, some amazing movies. Vertigo is one. Um, Marnie is another. Rear Window. There's a bunch. There's a bunch, and I could talk about them for a long time. But here he is, and the reason why he's here mm, might surprise you, or maybe it won't surprise you at all. I don't know. But, uh, you know, he's saying good evening. This is his trademark. And where did he say this the most? When he was introducing, not his movies, but his TV shows. He had, uh, I don't think he directed hardly any of them, but he produced a TV show. I think he produced it in the 1960s, uh, early 1960s. First he did Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which was a half hour show. And then I think he, yeah, after, after the half hour one, uh, was the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. And I'm going to be talking about one of those episodes of the show, the Alfred Hitchcock Hour show, in the context of this video and what I'm going to try. Oh, and I hope I do succeed uh, when I try to explain this concept of iconography in art and why it's important and why it's a controversial subject. Or it can be. But anyway, so here's uh, Alfred bidding us a good evening. And here's another one <laughs> that I found. This is, these are GIF, GIF, or dot GIF, or whatever you want to call them, images. Um, he had a very <laughs> morbid sense of humor. Uh, I think that's putting it mildly. Uh, and this is probably on the set of one of his other very famous movies, Psycho. Uh, why do I say that? because of the shower. I see a shower curtain there. But, like I said, today I'm going to talk about iconography, and let's just get right to it. Uh, here's the Wikipedia page. You know how much I you should by now, if you've, if you've watched any of my videos so far. You should by now know that I have a thing for Wikipedia pages. I love them. And I think of them as wonderful little compact beautifully organized uh, pieces of uh, information about any given subject, just about anything you could think of, just about anything you could think of. You can find it right here on Wikipedia. And here's the one for iconography. So, and another reason why I do this is because it makes my job uh, in explaining things here in these videos a little bit easier. And why wouldn't I use it? It's just so convenient. I suppose these are all of the um, excuses 
that other people use when they go to Wikipedia rather than doing actual real research, whatever that means. Uh, but so here we go. Iconography, as a branch of art history, studies the identification, description, and interpretation of the content of images, the subjects depicted, the particular compositions and details used to do so, and other elements that are distinct from artistic style. The word iconography comes from the Greek, I'm not even going to try to read that, from the Greek image and to write or to draw. Okay? I know that doesn't look like much right there. It's not a very large paragraph, but they've said a lot. They've said a lot. It's this, it studies the identification, description, and interpretation of the content of images. So that tells you right away that there's a lot of, I don't want to say guessing going on, because that's not fair. Maybe assumptions. Yeah, I'll go ahead and say yes, assumptions. I know it says interpretation, but hmm. Lots of times interpretations are at least partially based on assumptions. At least that's my opinion. I could be wrong. Um, but I'll go down here to this third paragraph. In art history, an iconography may also mean a particular depiction of a subject in terms of the content of the image, such as the number of figures used, their placing and gestures. The term is also used in many academic fields other than art history, for example, semiotics and media studies, and in general usage for the content of images, the typical depiction in images of a subject and related senses. Sometimes distinct distinctions have been made between iconology and iconography, although the definitions and so the distinction, distinction made varies. When referring to movies, genres are immediately recognizable through their iconography, motifs that become associated with a specific genre through repetition. Now, as you can see, this is a complicated term. It doesn't mean the same thing every time it's used. That's why I said it's a complicated term. But I'm going to stick to the study of iconography in the field of art history for this video. Okay. Now this paragraph here mentions um, the production or study of religious images called icons in the Byzantine and Orthodox Christian tradition. Now it says see icon. And that's exactly what I did. I clicked over to the word icon, um, the, the Wikipedia article for that word. And I'm going to read that too. An icon from the Greek image resemblance is a religious work of art, most commonly a painting in the cultures of the East, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, and certain Eastern Catholic churches. They are not simply artworks. An icon is a sacred image used in religious devotion. The most common subjects include Christ, Mary, saints, and angels, although especially associated with portrait-style images concentrating on one or two main figures. The term also covers most religious images in a variety of artistic media produced by Eastern Christianity, including narrative scenes, usually from the Bible or the lives of saints. I'm not going to go much further than that. Okay? There are other uses for the word icon. More popular uses, like when you talk about a celebrity or somebody who's famous, they're, they're for whatever reason, famous. Uh, they're referred to as an icon. read this again <laughs> on your own time read this again and compare and contrast and think about it for a little while 
some ideas might hit you. You might have some epiphanies and revelations in, in your mind. I'll just leave it at that. But basically, it's, it's an image made specifically. And I would say in this context, exclusively, for religious devotion, for worship. It's a tool used for that. So you could even say that the people who regard an image like this, made for this purpose, it's, they might even think of that image as one that contains special characteristics, maybe even something such as magical powers. Yeah, but that's, that's, I'm just, I'm, I'm here with this word icon so I can give a better understanding of this word iconography and what's going on. So the iconography that studies, it, it studies the identification, description, and interpretation of the content of images. It's a branch of art history. Okay, now, iconography, and I think this in, article even emphasizes that sometimes distinctions have been made between iconology and iconography. If you're an art historian, if you mix these two up, you're going to get funny looks. If you're an art historian and you say one of these instead of the other when you really mean the one, you, people are going to say, wait, you don't know the difference. <laughs> you should. <laughs> you should know the difference between iconography and iconology. So let me look at iconology right quick and read that for you. Uh, iconology is a method of interpretation in cultural history and the history of the visual arts used by people like A.B. Warburg and Erwin Fanofsky, who I'm going to discuss here, uh, and their followers, that uncovers the cultural, social, and historical background of themes and subjects in the visual arts. Though Panofsky differentiated between iconology and iconography, that's part of the reason you need to know this, uh, the distinction is not very widely followed. And there have never been, and they have never been given definitions accepted by all iconographers and iconologists. Few 21st century authors continue to use the term iconology consistently and instead use iconography to cover both areas of scholarship. Okay. All right, now, that gives you a little bit of an idea. More confusion, right? We've got a definition for the word icon that is that you could kind of play with. It's a little bit fast and loose, this definition <laughs> here. And I think that's deliberate. I don't think, you know, they could be, they could be more specific if they wanted to be, but they decided on this. So I'm just going to leave that there. Iconography branch of art history, studies, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Iconology is a method of interpretation used by, among others, this guy, Erwin. Here's he, here he is, right? Erwin Panofsky. Uh, high point of the modern academic study of iconography, which you, which he used in hugely influential works like his little book, Renaissance and Renaissances in Western art and his masterpiece, Early Netherlandish Painting. Many of his works are still in print, including studies in iconology, humanist themes, and the art of the Renaissance, meaning in visual arts, and his 1943 study, The Life and art of Albrecht Dürer. Pronofsky's ideas were also highly influential 
in intellectual history in general, particularly his use of historical ideas to interpret artworks and vice versa. Okay. <clears throat> why am I why am I concentrating on Panofsky? Because I'll just come out and say it. I like him. <laughs> I like him and I like his theory. And I don't care whether or not people say that it's no good. Um, I enjoy it. I think there's a lot going on. I'm not ready to dismiss it or overlook it or whatever. I want you to concentrate on this part right now. Uh, this is from his studies in iconology. And this is his three levels of art historical understanding, which I think are extremely important. Whatever you might think of Erwin Panofsky, if you've read him before, if you've heard of him before, he hits on some really good ideas when he, when he talks about this. Um, three different levels of understanding in a work of art. That's actually kind of a lot in its own way. It's kind of a lot. And what this tells you is that somebody like him looked at art and said, something's going on here. Something's going on here that can't easily be explained. It needs different tiers or levels of explanation. Now I'm going to go into it a little bit. Uh, before I, before I do, I just want to get some kind of administrative stuff out of the way. I've got a couple of links lined up. This one from the Tate, uh, discussing or explaining or defining iconography as an art term. The iconography of an artwork is the imagery within it. And you've got this down here and you can, um, look at that whenever you'd like to. There's an online textbook that also has a little article or a page on the subject. And you, have you noticed, we've already seen this painting a couple of times, because when this subject is brought up, iconography, iconology, etc., a lot of times this painting is used to discuss it. Um, it's called the Arnolfini Portrait by Jan van Eyck, done in the year 1434, oil on canvas, etc. Okay. It's famous. And because it's not just used to discuss iconography and etc., it's also used to discuss another um, thing popularized by, I'm pretty sure it was Panofsky. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I hope I haven't made a terrible mistake. No, I don't think so. Um, disguised symbolism. Okay, let me see if they even mentioned that here. Disguised. Yeah, thank goodness, there it is. All right. All right, I will, yeah, the, yeah, Penhofsky was the first to interpret Jan van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait. That's why it seems to be, this, this painting seems to be part of every discussion <laughs> regarding iconography, iconology, disguised symbolism. Okay, let me just blast through these links to Smart History. Really cute little website. Um gives you a good summary of art historical periods and what have you. So, and I've got the page lined up for what we're discussing today in the video, an introduction to iconography and iconol... <laughs> no, an introduction to iconography and iconographic analysis. Sorry, got a little tongue-tied once again, that happens. So they use Wonder Woman in this article, and then they jump from Wonder Woman to Jesus. So my stars. Um, <laughs> oh, golly. And they mention Erwin Panofsky, too, as you can see. Uh, so this guy 
interesting. Just just interesting how every, you know it all goes back to him somehow. Uh, symbolism. Why is this here? Because people get iconography as if as if the difference or the differentiation between iconography and iconology wasn't confusing enough. Some people confuse it with symbolism, which I maybe shouldn't have even mentioned this, but I'm doing it to just let you know that they're not the same thing. Symbolism was a late 19th century art movement of French, Russian, and Belgian origin in poetry and other arts seeking to represent absolute truths symbolically through language and metaphorical images, mainly as a reaction against naturalism and realism. Okay, you can read the rest of this yourself. I will definitely put the link there for you, but I just wanted to make it clear. And if you wanted any more of an explanation, you have this. This is awesome. This page, whoever put it together, my stars, they did a great job. And of course I can't read through all of this, but if you are interested, you certainly can. And I'm going to leave the link. Um, symbolism and iconography. This talks about both. And it talks about why they, they, they occupy their own kind of area. Um, that sometimes that those areas intersect, but it's still good to be aware of the differences. So a symbol is an image or a sign that is understood by a group to stand for something. Okay. Iconography refers to the symbols used within a work of art and what they mean. Okay, so this is a discussion or a study or an attempt at understanding this. Does that make sense? Oh, I hope it does. I hope it does. Now, let me not confuse you any further. Linguistic determinism. <laughs> God help us all. Um, I'm not going to talk about this here either, but I do want you to know that it exists. Is the concept that language and its structures limit and determine human knowledge or thought as well as thought processes such as categorization, memory, and perception. The term implies that people's native languages will affect their thought process and therefore people will have different thought processes based on their mother tongues. Okay. It might not seem like it's related to iconography, iconology, symbolism, <laughs> or any of that stuff, but I think it is. And I'm not going to try and explain that or discuss that in this video. No. But I'm definitely going to try and explain and discuss this in a future video where I would like to present for your consideration my theory or my um, opinion on how to read pictures. How to read pictures, how to read, you could say how to read art. I think I like how to read pictures better. And I'm, I hope and I, I, I pray that I will be able to make that video because it's going to be a dilly. But Linguistic determinism and linguistic relativity. The hypothesis of linguistic relativi relativity, also known as the Sepper Whorf hypothesis, the Whorf hypothesis or Whorfianism, is a principle suggesting that the structure of a language affects its speaker's worldview or cognition, and thus people's perceptions are relative to their spoken language. <laughs> Again, I'll discuss this in another video, but I just wanted to um, wanted you to be aware of it. Now, moving on. This article from the New Yorker, Harvard. No symbology here. Why am Why am I showing you this? This is from two thousand and nine, um, a while ago, but still very relevant. I'll just read this first bit here to sort of show you why I put it here. Why are there no professors of symbology in the world? John Langdon, the professor of 
typography, who is also the inspiration for Dan Brown's super sleuth Robert Langdon, a professor of symbology at Harvard, explained yesterday on Slate that all the real-life academics who pursue lines of study similar to the fictional Langdons interpreting religious iconography, deciphering codes made of symbols, already have perfectly fine titles to describe what they do. So we have professors of religious iconography, professors of cryptography, and plain old art historians. Okay, so I don't know what happened when this movie was made or this book was written, but I, it seems like Dan Brown just made this up. <laughs> and this, this, unfortunately, this has, I'm not going to say deceived, because I could be wrong, but it certainly misled, whether intentionally or not intentionally. Uh, it's misled a lot of people. They think that there's real life people, like the person in this movie, who are professors or doctors of symbology. And that just isn't so. So I, I put that there, and you can read this article in, if you'd like in the links. Or click on the links in my in my video description. No. Let me get back to this. Iconography. The study of it. Yeah? So iconography means that you're studying not just images or symbols. But you're studying why they're there. Who made them? And why? And then, on top of that, not just who made them and why, but why are they being used in this, that, or the other work of art? Okay? So, you can read through this on your own time, but I'm just sort of scrolling through just so you can get an idea of the different topics or the different kind of um, subtopics discussed in this article. Okay? What are the foundations of it? Oh, Giorgio Vasari. He's everywhere. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, go, go through this. I want to kind of get back to, where was I? Oh yes, this. Arnolfini portrait. Right? Hidden disguise symbolism. How does one even do this? Hmm? How does one even do um, a study of iconography? In a what you know, uh, or iconology rather, what am I saying? Iconology as um, Panofsky would have. Right? The three strata of subject matter or meaning, or meaning, okay? Primary or natural subject matter. The most basic level of understanding, the stratum consists of perception of the work's pure form. Okay? He uses the Last Supper. Really good example, because it's to people in the Western world who are raised in Christian households, they automatically recognize what the the image of the Last Supper means. To people who aren't Christians, or who've never heard of Jesus or whatever, they're just looking at a painting of 13 men sitting down at a table. Okay? That's the primary or natural subject matter. Secondary or conventional subject matter. It goes a step further brings to the equation cultural and iconographic knowledge. Right? Like I just said, a Westerner would realize that you're looking at, when you're looking at the Last Supper, you're looking at a very important scene in the life of Christ that is basically the foundation for 
Christianity. Or one of them. I can't say it's the foundation. Uh, the foundation for Christianity is Christ. And that's kind of, not, not just Christ, but accepting uh, communion or the host or whatever you want to call it. Okay? The third or tertiary or intrinsic meaning or content this level takes an account, into account personal, technical, and cultural history into the understanding of, an art, of a work. It looks at art not as an isolated incident, but as a product of a historical environment. Okay, so, as you can see, this makes analyzing or trying to figure out a work of art kind of difficult because there's all these layers to deal with first you have to describe this is like you know first you have to describe the image what are you looking at can you recognize the forms that you're looking at are they people are they buildings are they whatever and then you have to take your observations of just the bare description of what you're looking at just the facts no interpretation just facts and then you have to take those facts and see whether or not they could conform to some cultural or religious uh, rules and regulations regarding what certain images or concepts or ideas mean in that culture or in that system of belief or what have you. And then the third one is you take this from the second part and then do even more with it. it takes into account personal technical and cultural history it's essentially as it says here it is the art history i'm sorry the art historian asking what does it all mean and i think there's like a much more basic list here no not the tate maybe this Oh, no. Let me, let me find it. Oh, there it is. German art historian. No, 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 no. Three steps. Pre-iconographic. That's just describing the image. What do you see? Primary or natural subject matter. Number two, convention and precedent. What's going on in, possibly, in the culture or the group of people or whatever that this image was made for and how could this be a representation of images from their religion mythology uh, their creation myth where they come from as as a group of people whatever and then uncovering the intrinsic meaning iconology okay oh this maybe it's uh, maybe Maybe it's not as hard as it looks, or maybe it's much harder than it looks. I don't know. I don't know. Not going to talk about symbolism, no. Um, but I did say I was going to talk about this thing. Oh, the Arnolfini portrait. My goodness. This thing is used because from, I guess, our modern day standpoint, you look at this painting made in 1434 by Jan van Eyck and a modern day person living in the year 2022 would say okay that's a picture of two people together this looks like a man this looks like a woman they're holding hands but not quite they're, they're not really gripping each other's hands and you know that's that and they're surrounded by <laughs> This very odd-looking room with very odd-looking objects in it. Okay. 
and that's that. But when you look at this painting for a little longer or a little closer, you begin to see that there's a lot of stuff here that doesn't make sense right away. Might not ever make sense because that nobody's ever really solved this painting. They, I don't know if they figured out why this painting was made in this manner. Um, what's going on? And there's the theories about this painting are kind of far out, but you know, there's shoes on the floor. These are a pair of shoes. Those are a pair of shoes. I think these here belong to him, and these back here belong to her. So they're both, they're both barefooted in this room, which is a little odd. There's this little dog down here in between them. There's a mirror uh, behind them. There's a chandelier. Or what is this? Chandelier candelabra with only one lit candle. All the other spaces for candles, there's no candle. Just one candle with this little flame you can see here. There's this hutch behind him, or it seems like a hutch, looks like a hutch, with some fruit on it. Are those oranges? I'm not sure. There's a bed behind them. There's a fly whisk. Or, no, a whisk broom, I'm sorry. A whisk broom, okay. There's some items on this windowsill. Is that another piece of fruit? Uh, he's making a gesture with his hand. There's a lot of red in this room. Her dress, her outfit is very green. And when you zoom in, like really, really, really zoom in on this mirror behind them, you can see the reflected image of the artist drawing or painting this painting. And the artist has even signed it here. It says Jan van Eyck was here. This in this calligraphy above the mirror. Now what started out looking like a pretty simple painting, all of a sudden, <laughs> is, is a little peculiar. <laughs> because these choices to fill this room, or, you know, the part that surrounds them, uh, it, it's a little... seems a little odd, at least to us. Why does it seem odd to us in the modern world? Because we're not from this world. We're not from geographically where these people are from. At least, you know, I, I assume a lot of us aren't. If you live in the United States, you're you're not familiar with this area in Europe. Uh, or maybe you've never been there. Um, and you don't know the customs of the time unless you've studied them. When you just look at a painting, you don't have time right away to go to the library and learn what they were doing at this time in history in this country. I think it's the Netherlands, or what we now in the modern day call the Netherlands. Maybe it was, you know, Flanders, I'm not sure. We don't really know how people were doing things back then. We have some idea, but it's so far removed from who we are now and what we do now. Even though the religion is basically the same, Christianity, Catholicism, you know. And this painting, like I said, it features prominently in Panofsky's discussion of disguised symbolism. Okay? And I will read this. And I will read this. Uh, Panofsky, Panofsky became particularly well known for his studies of symbols and iconography in art. First in a 1934 article, then in his early Netherlandish painting, Panofsky was the first to interpret Jan van Eyck's Arnold Feeney portrait as not only a depiction of a wedding ceremony, but also a visual contract testifying to the act of marriage. Panofsky identifies a plethora of hidden symbols 
that all point to the sacrament of marriage. Now, you saw the painting, now you try to think of what those could be. In recent years, this conclusion has been challenged, but Panofsky's work with what he called hidden or disguised symbolism is still very much influential in the study and understanding of Northern Renaissance art. Now, I love this idea. Disguised symbolism. What does that mean? And they don't really un explain that and they don't really uh, supply a link if you'd like to read more about disguised symbolism. Did you notice that? Usually, like, look at all these other links. Jan van Eyck, Lin Netherlandish painting, Albert Dürer, yeah, ugh, everything. Look at all, link, 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 link. So many blue letters here. But for disguised symbolism, let me check. Control F, yeah? Mm -mm. It's not here. This is also why I like Wikipedia. They seem to be <laughs> deliberately omitting um, <laughs> any dis any any further discussion about disguised symbolism. There's no link to another article about disguised symbolism. At least not one that I can find here with Control F. Why? So as much as I enjoy Wikipedia because it's nice and convenient, I also enjoy it because I also look for what they're not saying. I look at what they're saying when I'm interested in something and I read a Wikipedia article about it. I look at what they're saying. I read what they've written. But I also try to, if I can, try to notice what they seem to be avoiding or what they haven't written. And I'm not even reading between the lines. I'm just noticing or trying to notice. Stuff like this. They, they mention disguise symbolism, but they sure don't elaborate on what that could or might be or any other discussion. People have written about this. Don't, don't make no mistake. People have written about disguise symbolism, but you're not going to find it in the notes here, are you? Or if you can find it, let me know. Mentioning Erwin Panofsky is not enough. Disguise symbolism, in my opinion, if it's a valid way to look at and de basically decipher or decode paintings, ooh, it could, it could, you know, it could, it could be a game changer. And they don't even want to discuss it. Okay, Wikipedia. All right. Whatever. But, um, I like this theory of disguised symbolism so much that I might even be using it in my videos to discuss some artworks in the future. So stay tuned for that if any of this interests you. Now, um, I'm pretty sure that I haven't done a very good job of <laughs> discussing iconography iconology, icons, um, and all the rest, but I think this is a good introduction. I hope I, I've sparked your interest. Now, I showed this guy in the beginning, Alfred. Alfred, and you should have seen the blood. Uh, he's just horrified, isn't he? He's talking, this, this, is, a, this is like an ad from, he's, he's promoting the Psycho movie. Um, but I always like to take these concepts, iconography, iconology, Erwin and his work on stuff like disguised symbolism. And I like to try where I'm trying to look for something. I, I'm, I, there it is. My goodness. I try to apply them to more modern day things. It may be things that they're not usually applied to, such as TV shows or movies. Now, I'm not a, I, I'm not a film scholar. I don't do film theory, and it would be wrong of me to pretend that I know what I'm talking about uh, in that area of study, because I don't. Because I have maybe some little bit of uh, just 
tiny, tiny, tiny bit of understanding in that field or what, what have you. But I'm not going to even, even try to speak with any authority about it. But this episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour, as you can see, this is the uh, title card of the episode, The Sign of Satan. All right, this is how the episode started off. Like Alfred, Alfred would show up in the beginning. They would play that song, um, I think it was called... Oh. Requiem for a marionette, or I don't want to get, I don't want to get it wrong. Don't quote me, but interest, like interesting song that was played and chosen to be the opening for this show. And then Alfred would show up, and he'd be, you know, sitting down or standing up or whatever, and he would say his famous "Good evening," and. I don't know why there's an exclamation point here. I don't ever remember him exclaiming uh, when he said good evening, but whatever. And then he would get into it. He would he would talk about something that seemed completely unrelated to the show that you were about to see. He would talk about some, just something totally that seemed nonsensical or seemed odd. But it was related to the show. You just had to figure out how. And you couldn't really figure out how until you saw the story, until you saw the actual show with the actors and what have you. All right, so that's what Alfred would do when he would introduce his show. And then this, you know, after after every single episode, Alfred, big time movie director, Alfred Hitchcock would show up, do his little intro, and then they would show this title card that with the title of the story that you were you were about to view and then then it would begin right and these are so good if if you're interested please do find them and watch them i love them that otherwise i wouldn't be talking about this and this is the internet movie database page for the sign of satan um Season 2, episode 27, aired May 8th, 1964. 48 minute runtime. Who's in the episode? This guy. Who's pretty famous for like 70s horror movies. He played Dracula a whole bunch of times. Um, Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee. And I think in more recent times, he's, he, he was in, oh, what was that movie? Was it Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or something like that? But this is him when he was younger, okay? And he's the star of the show. He plays a German actor named Carl Jorlau, who is running away from something. And in order, he thinks that taking a job in Hollywood, working on a movie, is going to protect him from a satanic cult that is trying to find him and kill him. And he happens to be a member of the cult. Why, you know, I'm, I'm explaining it to you, but the synopsis is here. Uh, the Alfred Hitch, the Hitchcock Zone, uh, the Alfred Hitchcock Wiki. And of course, I'll provide a link to this as well if you'd like to read it and reread it or click on any links throughout it or whatever. Uh, Carl Yorla is a European horror movie star who is contracted by a Hollywood studio to appear in his first American film. The film's producers watch a demo movie of Yorla as the leader of a satanic cult and feel he is perfect for their new film. After he comes to America, Yorla grows worried that real Satanists are after him. He thinks they could kill him for allowing him his demo film to be shown. All right, this is an interesting story. I wish I could provide um, a link, <laughs> but I can't. No, you're just going to have to go seek that out on your own if you're interested in watching this famous, famous, famous actor play in this famous, famous, famous show, in this pretty famous, uh, in my opinion, and if it's not famous, it's pretty darn good episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. Why am I showing you this? 
you might be asking yourself in the context of this video about iconography and iconology and my favorite where is it disguise symbolism there's a quote from this episode right there's a quote from it um where yorlo this guy talks this character in the show talks about the symbolism of his group a, gr a group of devil worshippers satanists and he's he says once you've learned the sign of satan you begin to see it everywhere so this character his argument was or his what he was trying to explain to the people surrounding him uh, at this hollywood movie studio where they were filming this movie is he was trying to explain to these people that members of his cult his satanic cult were everywhere in society in all levels uh, up all the way up and down the totem pole in every industry they were they were there whether you knew it or not and if you weren't a part of the thing then you wouldn't know it but and not only were they there in every segment of society in every industry in um, every field in every location in different countries and etc but they had also basically embedded their symbolism into so many different places basically all over the place and the only way you could recognize that symbolism it, be able to identify it and know it for what it was be able to know what it meant was if you were part of the cult and when you know if you're part of the cult i'm talking about the world of this tv show if you're part of the cult and you know this knowledge you know <laughs> you know this knowledge um you you see those symbols everywhere and you realize and you know that the members of that cult run everything that should sound familiar to you i mean i don't even know if i have to say it you can maybe fill in the blanks on your own but this guy in the beginning of the movie or i'm sorry not movie tv show the episode of the alfred hitchcock hour as as you can see here he's depicted as being crazy and paranoid once you've learned the sign of satan you begin to see it everywhere he's yeah they the, the people in you know surrounding him they think he's a nut job shouldn't be taken seriously maybe he's got mental issues maybe he's just tired and you know seeing things this is why i urge you to get your hands on a copy of this episode i don't want to spoil it for you that's why i stopped reading this here you could probably pause the video and read the rest of it yourself um but i don't want to spoil it for you if you see the episode if you watch the episode you will find out whether or not yorla carl yorla played by christopher lee was really crazy at least in the world of this episode now what does this mean to this year <laughs> or what am i saying or this year for that matter <laughs> was erwin <laughs> crazy you know just like the character in this um show i don't know for some reason i can't find any link to where is it there it is disguise symbolism it's even hard to find on this page and this is very closely related to this guy the idea of disguise symbolism and when i do a control f there's only two matches neither of them are links or very thorough explanations 
They, it's, they, it's barely mentioned here. Barely. Once you've learned it, you begin to see it everywhere. <laughs> Is that what Erwin was doing? Now, I'm coming up, oh, 55 minutes I've been talking and talking and talking. And I don't know whether or not I've said a thing. But, you guys, people, art, art, art history enthusiasts, and art enthusiasts, and visual culture aficionados, uh, I want to stop right here and thank you for looking at this or yeah looking at this video watching it listening to it whatever you're doing uh i appreciate it a lot if you enjoyed this video please consider subscribing to my channel to get notifications for when i make more of them and if you liked it please do hit the like button if you didn't like it let me know in the comments. I would love that. I would really appreciate that because I'm always looking to improve um, on whatever it is that I'm doing here. I'm not quite sure yet, but I still want to improve. So uh, if you have any ideas for videos that or topics that you might be interested in or you might want me to discuss or even research for you, um, maybe you just don't have the time or you're too tired or whatever let me know when i say topics i mean art history and visual culture topics or even movies and stuff like that books that have to do with art history and visual culture uh, let me know about them in the comments or maybe even uh, send me an email or whatever and i will consider it i might even do it so i don't know what i should i want to do more videos like this where I discuss, where I take one idea or one concept and discuss it in depth in a way that introduces you to it and maybe hopefully makes you curious about it to the point where you're willing to click on some of the links in my description and then go here and maybe click even some more links and learn, you know, by the one thing leads to another method. Um, <laughs> that's my goal to make people curious about learning and uh, understanding and discovering and uh, there's, you know, you're never going to know everything, you're never going to learn everything, you're never going to understand anything because that's, in my opinion, kind of impossible. But like I said, I, I, I want to do more of these and maybe I want to title them something like Church Announcements. Maybe I'll do my church announcements series, and maybe once I get going, um, filling up that playlist or that series, you'll understand what I'm um, aiming at. I want to do a video about Gothic cathedrals. I want to do a video about, oh gosh, um, religion, religion or mythology and art like, you know, the ancient Mesopotamian religions, the ancient Egyptian religion, and how it's used in their art, or how it was used in their art, and then how it's still with us in the modern world, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not. Those are the kind of videos I want to make, and I'm, I'm thinking of titling that series Church Announcements. Um, we'll see what happens. But I think in the next video that I do, uh, like this, I might just talk about Gothic cathedrals because I love them and Marian uh, images, right? Um, so, you know, there's that. But once again, if you like this video, comment, like, subscribe, or whatever. I don't even know what the lingo is. Like, comment, subscribe. And like I said, for the next, for the next one, of videos like these. I will be doing more church announcements. Um, please stay tuned as well for more videos in my Hunter Biden series. And I just uh, introduced it very recently, but uh, more videos in my Shining series, the movie by Stanley Kubrick, directed by Stanley Kubrick. So, with all that being said, once again, I uh, 
I'm enjoying this a great deal and I do want to thank you for watching and if you do comment or if you do contribute any ideas or uh, what have you uh, I appreciate that a lot so until the next video uh, until I figure out what to do or how to do the next video I will go ahead and bid you bye bye so bye bye everybody <laughs>